Welcome, everyone. We're going to have a great uh, chat here with uh, one of my heroes, Rodney Brooks. Uh, we'll explain why he's heroic. He's heroic in, in many ways, uh, but in particular because he's a technical realist, maybe a, a technical adoption realist is the best way to describe him. His credentials are impeccable because he invented uh, or was the, the founder of the company that invented, and he, I'm sure, was the prime inventor of the Roomba, of which you all have uh, one, maybe, or you have experienced the Roomba. This is uh, this Rodney's company, uh, iRobot, that uh, produced the Roomba. Uh, he's since uh, left the company there, but uh, did that. He also did Baxter and Sawyer, two incredibly clever robots. If you want to uh, look them up online, they were some of the best uh, human interacting, human trainable robots around. Uh, he's also sold that company on. So he's but started a new company recently uh, that I'm sure we could talk about, but his credentials in understanding everything robotic and AI ML systems that interact with those robotic systems are, I think, unrivaled. Let's start with uh, your background, uh, where you came from, what you've done. Uh, you're a legend, of course, but uh, to the interns, a, a little bit of background would be really helpful. So over to you. Uh, where do you come from? How did you end up doing what you do? Yeah, I grew up in Adelaide, South Australia. Um, um, was born in the 50s. Um, it was sort of at the end of the earth because we all our uh, information came from the UK by a ship. So the uh, dates on any science magazine were three months prior to today's date when I would get my hands on it. Um, but I uh, was lucky enough uh, uh, to get accepted to Stanford University for my PhD in 1977, and I, I went to Stanford for that and have stayed in the United States ever since. So I am one of the immigrants who has started companies and, and uh, made things happen in the United States. So states in, in 77, I came to the states in uh, 87, so 10 years later and have stayed ever since. So I guess we have similarity in that regard. We, you uh, became a professor at MIT uh, for a prolonged period, right? And so I, I obviously went to Harvard for a, a short period, um, but explain a little bit about your, your path through Stanford to MIT, to the West Coast, to where you are now. Yeah, so I did my PhD at, at Stanford. I did a little postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. I did a two year postdoc at MIT. I went back to Stanford. I was on the faculty for one year then there. And then I went back to MIT, I was on the faculty for 26 years. And while there, I um, was at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, and I became director of that in 1997. And then I joined it with the Lab for Computer Science in 2003, and that's now CSAIL, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, which now got 1,200 members. It's the biggest lab at MIT. Um, it's probably one of the biggest AI and computer science labs in the world. But let's uh, connect to how does MIT then lead to, to uh, iRobot and the Roomba? Well, I was doing robotics at, in my day job at MIT. Yeah. I was doing robotics research. And, you you um, were always uh, uh, explain that, was it your 15th version of a robotic system that was the Roomba? Yes, we had 14 failed business models. And then in 2002, we had two successful business models. Um, one was the Roomba, but cleaning houses. Another was one that we'd been working on for many years, but it, a, a crisis had happened. That was a, a robot we'd been working on with DARPA, um, the PacBot, uh, which was a small robot which could a soldier could teleoperate. And the, the thing that made it real was the US in Afghanistan and Iraq and roadside bombs. And, that robot then was used, uh, there were 6,500 of them deployed in those two oh. theaters, uh, to de to deployed to um, let the soldiers um, handle these roadside bombs without themselves getting blown up. Um, and that was a Did real- Did that was similar to the Roomba? I mean, it sort of shuttled around in a similar drivetrain, similar software, was there a kind oh, of- No, no, not at all. It was a totally different hardware system, um, uh, and it was teleops. Um, it had some intelligence, but... Uh, it was teleop from nearby, though. Nearby. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and here's, here's, here's one lesson we learned, which I think is important for anyone involved in innovation. We had the greatest interface for teleoping, teleoping that we could think of as MIT-trained engineers. <laughs> um, you know, you could do anything. You'd go down, and, this, and it was in a, you know, a, 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 a 
explosive resistant laptop which you know crushed the lap. Um, the users were 19 year old kids out of the US who had just joined the military and got deployed. Um, the, US, the, the military removed the manuals that we packed with the robots. So they were given to these kids without any manual and with this user interface that only an engineer could love. Yeah, of course, yeah. And that, so what we did was we, we, we built a, a, a hardened Game Boy interface and used the same commands that we used in video games, the same interface with the same knobs and suddenly the usability went way up. And I, I see, so there was sort of a wholesale rejection of the interface and suddenly the Game Boy interface and everything changes. Yeah, and here was, here was the key lesson for someone in, in, in research or engineering. Uh, the, our engineers said, but they can't do X yes. with the interface. But they, they went from 0% usage to 80% usage. Uh, they, they used 80% of the features because 80% were available with the, the Game Boy interface. To the engineers, but they can't do this. Well, I run into that every day, Rodney, explaining that uh, the experience has to come first and the feature capability second is very hard, I think, for engineering or science types to appreciate because if with ourselves, like the detail, like the depth, see the superficiality as somehow trivializing what we've done. But in fact, as, as Richard Hamming has always said, and I always quote him in Bell Labs, you know, if you're not solving a a, a material problem you, you're solving a problem of your own devising that may be interesting but if it's not having market impact then you've actually lost a lot of the value that that you should have been creating and it's sort of irresponsible in a way because a lot of money and investment went into creating this thing but you're not making it adoptable by the market now some market things are, are just timing sensitive but i absolutely try and convince everyone that if it's not usable then it's not a success and even if it's got the best set of features and capabilities and forward looking and, 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 uh, and stable and reliable capabilities that you, you know, it just isn't, it isn't going to win. So um, let's, let's go to your predictions. Cause I think we've naturally ended up there. Uh, so Rodney, you've written this set of, I think starting two years ago, uh, your quantifiable prediction list, three broad topic areas, AI, ML, Vehicle, vehicular systems or robotic systems and space. Uh, great insights there. And I, I generally agree with nearly everything because I think my fundamental view is, uh, yes, you have to solve the complete problem, not just the toy problem. And solving complete problems in the real world is super hard. So you can talk a bit about your view yeah. on that. The other so, is, I think, human machine interactions make it even harder. But uh, go ahead and, and sort of give your guiding principles, yeah. and we'll talk about. Uh, I, I think we'll come to autonomous vehicles a bit later, perhaps. I'll, I'll start. I, okay. Out, out of that blog post, which I've, I've promised I will update every year for 32 years, um, on, and give myself a score on how right or wrong. Well, if you keep leaving, living the good life in Hawaii, uh, Rodney, you're going to make it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but out of that, uh, actually, I, I can't remember whether it was in IEEE Spectrum or MIT Technology Review, uh, I wrote an article about what's easy and what's hard. It came directly from some of the text in that, in that first blog post. And in that article, I said that making um, reusable rockets and electric cars is easy. Building something like Hyperloop is incredibly hard. And uh, why the difference? For those of you who don't know what the Hyperloop is, can you explain a bit? You get in capsule, you get shot under air pressure sort of system. Well, the, yeah, Hyperloop has come to mean many things, but uh, the idea was a prototypical case, a tunnel from LA to San Francisco um, with the air evacuated out of it. And there's these little capsules that are in there and people are together inside the capsule and it goes at over 600 miles an hour in this, in this tube. So, and it's from downtown to downtown, so you don't have to go to the airports, and, and it's... Uh, Windowless, super fast, over in an hour, but claustrophobic. Well, and now COVID uh, spreading. Of course, <laughs> COVID spreading at 600 miles an hour. Uh, but but I, want to, I, want to, I want to say why I said, and that was also Elon Musk's idea. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think Elon Musk, by the way, is one of the two greatest entrepreneurs in the world at the moment. The other one is Jeff Bezos. These are... These are two entrepreneurs who stand out for me beyond everyone else. But 
the sort of implied criticism is that um, Elon thought that was just as easy as reusable rockets and as electric cars. But reusable rockets, everyone said, wow, that's, that's amazing. But a lot of the problems were already solved. We had 3,400 liquid fueled um, rockets built during World War II, the V2s, uh, you know, and they started firing, landing on London. Um, 3,200 liquid fueled robots back in the 1940s. We have a long history of how to build a rocket. Um, well, the pieces, there's an industry, there's um, insurance companies insuring launches, there's launch facilities. Everything was sort of built up over this 50 or 60 year period. So rockets weren't just plopped down in the world with no rockets. There was already a great, great infrastructure. And ah, but reusable rockets. Well, the grid fins that they use to guide, they have been around since the 1960s. Um, the US's biggest bomb, uh, Mother of all bombs, MOAB, has grid fins. That's how it's guided itself. Every Soyuz launch has grid fins. That's how the emergency escape system works in the Soyuz. And two years ago, that got deployed with a, with a cosmonaut and an astronaut. Um, vertically landing, well, in the 90s, there was the DCX out at White, uh, uh, White Sands Missile Range. There were 10 launches by the US of a conventional rocket, which came back and landed. Obviously, the Harrier jump jet, you know well as well. Yes, and the Harrier jump jets, Rolls Royce with their flying bedstead, which turned into the Harrier jump jets. You know, the first, um, we've, we've actually had rockets with manned rockets do vertical landings on the moon since the since yeah, 1939. Um, so, I'm not saying that SpaceX is not an amazing achievement, but the components were all there. The entrepreneurship was in bringing them all together, yeah. getting the financing, doing all that stuff. It wasn't like a technical stuff that we had no idea how to solve. Likewise, electric cars, they've been around in a long time, Tesla's great vehicles, but he didn't have to reinvent, he didn't have to invent windscreen wipers. He didn't have to invent doors and door They were integrations and optimizations in some yeah, way. Yeah, and they've been electric cars since the 1920s. Yeah. So the, the, the stuff, but the Hyperloop, everything is new. Everything is new. How do people get in and out? What, uh, you know, if you don't want to stop um, at San Luis Obispo, what, how, how do you have a station that can take a thing in or not take a thing in and go straight, straight through? How are people going to react to being in that tin can um, at, at, at that speed? What earthquake, if, earthquake induced deviation of the tube. Yeah, the that will mess things up. But what if it breaks down? How do you rescue people? How do you get into the tube or in, anywhere? So there's just an incredible number of technical problems that have not previously existed or been thought about. Um, insurance for them, et cetera. Um, so that's a much harder problem uh, than reasonable rockets or electric cars, much harder. So that's what I, I apply to things. How much new stuff do you have to invent? If you have to invent everything, that's a long way from being a practical reality. Uh, but explain how uh, cars change cities more than forcing cars. Now, what, what is it about autonomous vehicles that w how we'll have to change our cities? Uh, yeah, uh, well, what would be the big changes? And, and some of, well, first, first, let me say some of the things that have not been, you know, really solved well or even looked at that are important for um, adoption of autonomous vehicles, even as a service. So, you know, driverless Ubers, driverless Lyfts. Um, it's not just you know, driving down the freeway and avoiding hitting stuff. Um, how, do, how do people um, get into the Uber and how does the Uber know that it's them? And how do they communicate with the Uber? Um, how does the car know that people have gotten out, et cetera? There's a whole interface thing that largely is not being where people have been concentrating on, but that usability is important. Then we get to more, more interesting questions. Likely we're going to use speech interfaces to these vehicles as a service. So you get in and say, I want to go such and such. And then you, then you want to change where you're going. Okay. Now let's suppose uh, dad is looking after the kids on the weekend and he, he doesn't want to go to soccer practice. So he calls an Uber and he puts his 13 year old in the Uber after soccer practice. Now the 13 year old's talking to the Uber. Well, I don't want to go here. I want to go there. Um, and well, is the Uber supposed to listen to the 13 year old or is the Uber supposed to listen to the, to the person who called it? Or who, who's it, who's it take command from? And at what point 
is the 13 year old driving the Uber without a driver's license. System, autonomous system system that will work. I think you and I both agree on campuses where the rules are well defined. The well, drivers, yeah. the vehicles. And, and on campuses, it's, it's, it's a good place for a number of reasons. Um, there aren't members of the public driving vehicles. Everyone else who's driving a vehicle in that same space is an employee um, and, and, um, and adopts the rule set. And, and is trained, told what yeah. to do. In a campus like, and a campus could be, uh, you know, a, a housing development for yeah. old people. We use it generally as a well-defined space where the rules are defined and you've signed up to that rule, those, right. those rules. And in those campus environments, the, it's, all, it's, it's going to be safe for the vehicle to stop at any point if it's confused. If you're on a freeway, you can't afford to stop, you know, when, when the traffic's going 65 miles an hour. You've got to keep going. Yeah, in, and, in and, and similarly, I guess, what, road conditions, well-defined, probably, yeah. whether bikes are allowed or not allowed, pedestrians allowed or not allowed, there's a rule set that you sort of can reasonably enforce. Right. And so that's where, um, you know, we are seeing um, um, so the, the trials of autonomous vehicles being deployed. They're, they're all in those sorts of environments. And of course, in industrials, there's a productivity gain that doesn't exist in the consumer side. So we always focus on the real driver of change is productivity gains, not, not consumers having fun. So ports, factories, manufacturing processes, all of these see incre increasing numbers of autonomous vehicles that deliver goods, move cargo containers, all of which were non-optimal human tasks because we're not very efficient at sort of scheduling tasks and, and, and doing things in concert. So all of those uh, seem to be good places. Ports are already highly automated. Mines, oh. highly automated. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, in Australia, the two biggest mining companies in the world are in Australia. Um, um, yeah, uh, Rio Tinto and... Rio Tinto and BHP Billet. They both have uh, enormous um, uh, um, iron ore uh, facilities in, in northwest and western Australia, um, well over a thousand kilometers from the nearest city. They have 450 ton trucks, which are autonomous uh, dump trucks, driving the iron ore to um, a, a, a railhead. Um, there are no other vehicles around, um, and those just, and it, it's just incredibly uh, expensive to get people to go on up and drive there. Um, so it, that has become a, a real. And also, I think the margin of error is actually beyond normal human attention. Uh, sometimes the, the tracks they're driving on are so narrow relative to the vehicle because of course any extra track width is often particularly with pit mines and things you know just taking out mining space uh i've heard that human attention is yeah. not not good enough to not avoid an error whereas machines can essentially replicate the task much more accurately but let's go to ones on the public roads do you believe and i think i've begun in fact bell labs is working on one of these projects some sort of specialized lane with specialized on off points is a, a place where you could you'll see autonomous vehicles in some sort of convoy uh what are your thoughts on that yeah i i, I um actually in, in in my blog where i give the predictions i say that i think that the first um uh, safe autonomous driving uh, for consumer cars will be uh, dedicated lanes that you have to have the software in your car to, to go in there. You go in there, it um, communicates with all the other vehicles and they convoy in that one lane. And then you take, our, take over when the lane ends and when you, when you get off. Uh, the same is probably gonna be true for uh, self-driving trucks. There will still have to be a human um, getting them into and out of the slot uh, and then they'll go. But these are still a few years away. Even and, that which is sort of the conveyor belt approach in some ways uh is is still a few years away but i agree that's the space but again it requires you to invest and, in that and, technology in your vehicle and what we're seeing today today um in many cities in the us is okay we're gonna have restaurants outdoors on what used to be city streets and this is an experiment you mean literally today because of literally COVID today, yeah literally today as you know places are trying to open up and not have people stuck together in close in proximity inside the restaurant. The real estate of the street is being repurposed. Um, so that may drive a restructuring of cities. COVID may end up driving a restructuring. So let's especially, go COVID. We'll come back to AI. 
Yeah. I think it is a restructuring thing. And I, my example is the fact we're video chatting. Before we would have cared what was behind us and we had to look a certain way uh, in a certain dress, uh, suit, et cetera, or whatever. Um, we would have worried about audio quality and lighting and, uh, and we wouldn't have done it. But we've, we've learned that video comm, something that was invented 50 years ago, uh, is actually a, a viable medium if we were just to give up on certain things that we had as preconceptions or habits. And now it's viable, not only viable, I would argue we've decided that we don't like travel anywhere near as much as we thought we did. In Summit, where I live in New Jersey, they've done exactly what you said, pavement uh, sidewalk is now restaurant space. And I'm sure that everyone will say, I don't want that to go back inside. Therefore, you can't use my sidewalk. Therefore, people have to now be in pedestrian. The roads become pedestrian because I need somewhere to walk. And in that pedestrian road, maybe I have a scooter lane. Yeah. Do you think there's a logic that goes in that direction? Well, I absolutely think, uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to know exactly where it's going to settle, but it, it, there is change and it's going to happen. And, and there's opportunities for people who can predict the change accurately to, to get ahead. True. But you see, that's why your heuristics are so interesting to me, is that the change predictors by the rule set, not necessarily the specific technology. So let's do another one then, and that same set, and it gets to robotics. Remote control, diagnosis, inspection, manipulation. Does COVID-19 drive a new uh, momentum towards remoting, remote interacting, controlling, managing, manipulating? Because we will have to be that way. Uh, our physical world is largely not instrumented or digitized yet. So we're going to have to have robots that help us see what we can't otherwise see because it's not directly connected yeah, or manipulate no. or control because again, it doesn't have a back end digital interface that allows us to do that. So we'll have to do it through the front side. Yeah. Now if we go out 50 years or hundred years, you know, with 5G and 6G, et cetera, with IOT, we will largely instrument our world, but there's vast tracks of our world that's going to take decades to correct. It's going to take decades. I would say even if we instrument it, we'll instrument, instrument to sense it, but not to have all the repair functions. So, you know, the, that's, so, the, the, that's, yeah. that's the problem is we can now know what the problem is maybe, but we still need a, a new system, a robotic system, a remote control system that tells that allows us to fix it. Right. Yeah. And, and for decades yet, we're still going to need the robots even have the sensing everywhere. Yeah, we agree with that. As you know, when we work on robotics problems, yeah, we I, like the idea of mobile robots because it's just a faster way to get an image than installing a hundred video cameras, you yeah. know, which, which, which are only in a fixed space drones, for you know, surveillance of critical activities rather than relying on just pre-installed cameras. So we absolutely agree. So mobile surveillance is a more efficient way to go. Right. But um, at the same time, there will be because of 5G and bad. Yeah, that will be massively instrumented. It will get instrumented. But even then, the robots will need to probably have a point of view specific to the task they're performing that, that requires, uh, you know, it, they're self-instrumented, I think. So, that, you know, they'll they still be useful so, sort of surveillance at a, perhaps with a higher precision uh, point of view or multiple modalities about video cameras. Maybe I want an infrared camera or UV or some other spectroscopy I need to apply. So, but that's that class. So we agree on that. Remote X is a thing. Uh, let's try a couple of other ideas on COVID. Uh, human interaction. How, will, how do you think human interaction will go? Will we become, and this is my question, more empathetic? And then, of course, there's a very topical question that I saw you posted a guest article on. But will we become more empathetic because we are now more digitally equivalent than we are in our physical environments? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, a new feature that I have seen and participate in a lot is actually social uh, video call interactions. Um, not just with my family, my grandson, et cetera, but um, with, with uh, work colleagues. Yeah, work uh, colleagues. And, and it, it, you know, it's an, sort of an important thing um, on top of the work, you know, scheduled work meetings, the social meetings have become important as a way just to do the chit chat that you would normally do in yeah. the office. And, and in fact, we increasingly weren't doing in the office, I would argue, because we were traveling so much, we never met each other anymore. Uh, we were fatigued enough that perhaps we didn't, we weren't at our best. And so we'd lost the good part of social interaction. I think we've recovered it oddly enough, 
to digital video. Wouldn't yeah. have guessed that one either, right? Right. Yeah, that's the problem with the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard to guess. Someone wants to see your sunrise. Can you flip your camera around? Um, so here we are. Uh, you know, it's a it's a horrible. Oh, that's nice. Uh, but yeah. And there is the beach. You weren't you weren't. Uh, there is the beach and there's the sun, um, you know, behind the clouds up there. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Rodney. Um, so while you sit back down, uh, a couple more COVID questions and then yep. uh, we'll uh, education. The, uh, and I, I like this one. I think it's an AR uh, thing. My view is education is going to be impacted by, yes, the ability to do remotely and use AR to live learn rather than pre-learn. But what do you think, Rodney? Uh, COVID-19 learnings and the future of education? Yeah, well, I, I think obviously um, education is, is being disrupted by COVID. Uh, it's being disrupted unevenly. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the people who have less access to bandwidth in their communities are suffering and less, uh, less um, less wealth so that every kid can have their own laptop in the house um, are, are being disproportionately disadvantaged uh, with this change in education. And I'm not blaming anyone yeah. for that. I'm pointing it's that out. Yeah. It's a fact. You know, it's a fact. And so... Um, well, so uh, let me interject there, uh, Rodney. AR, in, a, in not a complex headset way, but in a... I get information relayed to me, possibly over uh, AirPods, possibly just on the screen, directing me to the right action, uh, or it's just contextual information that's provided to me rather than generic information, because a system has learned about me. Uh, is AR the great hope for normalizing education so it's contextualized for each person in the way that they can consume it, both mentally and whatever devices they have available? Is AR the great hope for a new learning paradigm? I don't know how it impacts college learning, but the, it, we want to learn through dynamic contextual information, not generic. Is, do, you, do you see that? Yeah, I, I think that's a valid um, expectation. I also think that um, there is now a chance uh, for people to experiment in ways that didn't seem plausible. Uh, before, because we've gotten to this point that we know that video links are important and that we have to use them for, for at least a while, and it could be for a long time. Um, and so I think there's a there's room for some really smart ideas that um, we haven't had yet, and for people to experiment with and come up with novel things. Um, so yes, you may be right about that uh, about, about your your way of looking at what could be important and that's worth exploring but I'm, I'm guessing that you know some of the interns out there and I haven't said anything directly to, to you're going to do that next we're going to wrap up with your advice to interns three to five things yeah I'll, I'll just say you know this has been a tough situation for interns um, you know normally you would have come to Bell Labs you would have worked you know with people directly it's a very different experience so out of this figure out how to invent something to make it better um, uh, because that's been the one. greatest advice you could have given. And I, I think we've tried to say the same thing is learn from this, that there is a positive version of this. That is the future. If you can invent it, you've got a head start because you experienced it first. Right. Let's go with three to five things that you have learned. You want to relay to inventors, entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, the general category of people of which interns are sort of a subset. What would you like to tell them? And then we'll wrap up for this time. Well, well, here, here's my experience, and everyone's mileage varies. I found that incredibly important to read widely, to not read just in my particular field. But, you know, every week I read science and nature. Um, a lot of it is irrelevant to me, but I learn so much, and I see so many ideas, and I see so many different things. Um, so read widely. Don't be afraid of getting out of your uh, particular uh, lane that, you, that you're trained in. Um, uh, the other, another piece of uh, advice, which is sort of uh, still runs counter uh, to, to many other advices, say yes to everything. Um, say yes to every, every experience. I don't mean by that jumping out of airplanes, but every, 
every experience of interacting with, uh, with in, in some business, with some professionals, say yes to, uh, to thinking about some new problems, say yes to uh, going to a conference, so, mm -hmm. you know, how it's gonna be virtual, say yes to lots of things, because again, that lets you think of lots of things. And the third thing is, um, you will not make great contributions unless you are horribly, horribly wrong most of the time. Um, <laughs> if, if you're not being wrong, then you're not pushing the boundaries enough. I'll paraphrase so, that one. Being wrong is just so right. Yeah, that's yeah. Don't be afraid of it. Be attuned to when you are wrong and, and, and know when to give up. But um, don't be afraid. Well, I might be wrong, so I'm not even going to try this. Uh, try it, try it, and uh, in a responsible way. Though. And accept the the Brooksian law that you may be wrong 14 times before you're right. Yeah. So r being wrong a lot is even not a bad thing. If as long as you learn. I'm often asked how often has Bell Labs failed on something, and my answer is never. If we learnt each time. Right. If we, we learned something material that was worth it, obviously, if you learn trivial things, then perhaps you could see that as a failure. But if we learn something material each time, that's not a failure. That's just the beginning of the next version of something. And so I very much like that philosophy. Don't be afraid. Say yes. Uh, try read, read widely because it gives you a diverse perspective. I would add interact widely, which is a part of implied in yours and, and gets back to our COVID thing. Maybe I can interact more widely now. Uh, digitally than I could physically. And that's a positive. Do all those yeah. things and make a, a difference, I think, is the other one is. So many, so many seminar series have gone online and yeah. anyone can go to them Anyone now. can watch them. It's, it's essentially what Stanford had started sort of with their, with their massive online education stuff. But now everything's online. You can consume it. Uh, and then I think think big. Do human change, humanity changing things when you can, not trivial things. Sometimes yeah. you'll end up doing a more trivial version of that, but aim big and, and, and take the current imperative of disruption in society to improve it. So do things that are society improving at that level and not below, at least by aspiration. What do you think about that? I, I agree. So I hope you've enjoyed the time with Rodney. That's why we give you access to Rodney. Thanks very much, Rodney. It was early as everyone could tell from the sunrise. And, and, and fantastic. I, I, my last words to the interns, yeah. do good. Do good. Do something do good. good. Yeah, do good uh, and, and do it in a, in a sustainable, collaborative, collective way. All right. Uh, thanks, Rodney. I'm going to give you the round of applause uh, from the <laughs> collective interns. So fun, as always, uh, and see you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Do good. <laughs>